Good to see everyone. What a privilege it is to stand before you and preach the gospel. I never take this opportunity for granted. Thank you for allowing me to do this. And I'm humbled by your presence. We're here to worship God in spirit and in truth. Our number is noticeably down, but we do have quite a few that are out of town that has uh, been recognized and also a number that are shut in and on the sick list. But we've got a good number. I think we're about a little higher than we were, aren't we, Jimmy? If you came in. 82. 82. And Jimmy is never wrong. I questioned him one time, and I think he said two words at me. First time I ever heard him say two words at anyone. Usually it's just one. But he said two words after I called him on. But again, he was right. It's good to see everyone. We do have visitors. We have our friends and neighbors with us. We're glad to see you. Thank you for coming. And we welcome you back at each and every opportunity that you have. There are good people here at this congregation of Christ. And we strive to do God's will and live as Christians in this community. We want to go to heaven when we pass on. Genesis 45. Genesis 45. In Genesis 41, Joseph ascended to power. He had been in prison for quite some time, and Pharaoh has a dream. And Pharaoh needs that dream interpreted. So they called Joseph out of prison. And Joseph gives the interpretation of the dream that Pharaoh had. Seven years of plenty. That's going to be followed by seven years of famine. And the famine is going to be so severe that the seven years of plenty will be forgotten. Pharaoh needed to set aside grain during those good years so that they would have plenty when the famine came, during the bad years. Now, when Pharaoh heard this, heard Joseph interpret the dream, he uh, really, he elevated Joseph. He made him ruler of the land of Egypt, really, the governor of the land, the highest in command next to Pharaoh. And really, in a day, Joseph went from just being a prisoner to a prince, as it was in a day because of his interpretation. In, G in chapter 42 of Genesis and following, it tells about Joseph's brothers. And they lived in Canaan, which was a good distance away from Egypt, but they, in that land, still felt the effects of the famine, so they had to travel down to Egypt because they heard that there was grain there. They came before Joseph, Joseph recognizes them, and, but they don't recognize Joseph in this interaction. He puts them to a test, really, after these years have passed, to find out about his brothers now, what kind of men that they have become. And he tells them to go back home, and, and when they get back home, they realize they not only have the money, they have the grain also. But Joseph says, don't come back. If you come back, don't come back unless you bring Benjamin. Well, Jacob was reluctant to do that, Joseph's father. He was reluctant to do that at first because he did not want the same thing happening to Benjamin that he believed that happened to Joseph. But things got so bad, things got so bad that he went ahead and, and he let him go back there. So Joseph puts them to another test. And again, it, they, he sends them away with grain and money, but he puts a cup in the sack of Benjamin and Joseph sends his servants out, a servant out to, to investigate and to inspect. Sure enough, there's the cup. And so here they come back before Joseph. And, and he tells uh, the brothers to go home. But they don't. They stay there. And really, as they're there, they tried to explain what happened. That this must be some huge misunderstanding that this happened. We're, we're innocent men. We're not guilty of this thing. And Joseph is hearing all of this. And then what happens, Judah goes before Joseph and he pleads to Joseph uh, that, that you need to let Benjamin go back home because if you don't let Benjamin go back home, his father's going to die. And Judah offers himself as a slave for what's happened, as Joseph's servant for what happened. And, and he says, I'll, I'll do this. And it, it's ironic because Judah in the very beginning was the one that said, hey, I got an idea, let's sell Joseph into slavery. So there's some irony there that Judah, who first idea was to sell Joseph into slavery, now he offers himself up as a slave. It's at this point that Joseph knows that his brothers are quite different men than they were years ago. And it's at this point that, that and in particular, he looks at Judah. And, and then, then he reveals himself to who he is to his, to his brothers. Notice in chapter 45, verse 3. 
Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Please come closer to me. And they came closer, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been sent in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting, he says. Well, notice, I, I, I won't skip that. He says, God sent me before you to preserve for you the remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by great deliverance. Now, therefore, it is not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father of Pharaoh, the Lord of all his household, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all of Egypt. Come down to me and do not delay. Well, I want to go back. Let's turn back to 37, chapter 37. Sort of doing it backwards here. But I want us to notice the father's mindset here. When Joseph was sold into slavery, he was 17 years old. He's 39 now. 22 years has passed since he was sold into slavery. But I want us to notice his father and, and those years. Look at verse 29, beginning verse 30, chapter 37, verse 29. Reuben returned to the pit. Joseph was not in the pit, so he tore his garments. He returned to his brothers and said, The boy is not there. As for me, where am I to go? So they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped it tunic in blood. And they sent the very color to the, the, the coat of many colors. They brought it to their father and said, We found this. Please examine it and see whether it's your son's tunic or not. Then he examined it and said, It's my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his loins, and mourned for his son many days. Then all of his sons and all of his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, Surely I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Potiphar's officer, the captain, he said, the bodyguard. Now, when the brothers come home to Jacob, and they present this blood-soaked tunic, he reaches the conclusion that they want him to reach. He sends his son out to check on his brothers. He hasn't heard from Joseph for so many days, and, and here he's, he, they, they, they haven't heard from him. And his brothers come back with this coat of many colors soaked in blood, and his brothers say nothing. And so the silence of his brothers uh, tell Joseph, or tell Jacob, that, that his brother's gone, that his son's gone. Nobody's seen him. Nobody's heard from him. And, and we found this, this thing here. Is this his or not? And so they look at it, and he reaches a conclusion that they want him to reach, that Joseph is dead. But the evidence that was before him was what? It was false. It was wrong. It wasn't reality. The coat that they brought him was what? Soaked in blood of an animal. And really, they, they withheld material evidence from him. They'd seen him. They knew him. They talked to him. They sold him into slavery. They didn't say all this to their father. But as Jacob sat there, he was convinced that Joseph was dead. He was thoroughly convinced that he was dead. But all the time, what was he doing? He was alive and working as a slave in Potiphar's house. But in Jacob's mind, it was the truth. He's dead. He says, I'm going to have to die to go see him. He was that sure the only place that he's going to see his son again is in the afterlife. Jacob had lived 22 years with that, with that blood-soaked tunic and that thought that his son was dead, 22 years. Now, let's go back to chapter 45 again. Notice verse 21. Then, this is after they met up here, he says, then the sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons, According to the commands of Pharaoh, gave them provisions for the journey. To each he gave changes of garments, but to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver, five changes of garments. To his father he sent as follows, ten donkeys loaded with the best of things of Egypt, ten female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and substance for his father on the journey. So as his brothers 
he says, send his brother, so he sent his brothers away. And as they departed, he said to them, don't quarrel on the journey. Then they went up from Egypt and came down to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. They told him, saying, Joseph is still alive, and indeed he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. But he was stunned, for he did not believe them. When they told him all the words of Joseph that he had spoken to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. Then Israel said, it is enough. My son Joseph is still alive. I will go to see him, he says, before I die. See in verse 26 how he did not believe them at first. He was stunned. He didn't believe the news that he had heard. And you know what? He believed one thing, and 22 years of that conviction, just that one statement, that's not going to overturn what he believed to know to be true, that his son was dead. Hey, listen, Joseph is alive. I don't believe you. I don't believe his life. And so you go back, and they say their father's alive, well, or Joseph's alive. He's ruled the land of Egypt. 22 years the father believed this. He's going to say no. No, he's not alive. He's not alive. But as you read the evidence in the next verse, he changes his mind. What the testimony of the, his other sons gave him, all the evidence, the physical evidence of the carts, and all the provisions that have been given to him, he changes his mind, his conviction. Jacob, with all the evidence combined, believed that Joseph was alive. He didn't have to see him to believe it, did he? But he believed now that he was alive. He dismissed the false evidence that he was holding on to for 22 years. He put his old conviction behind him because now, because of the testimony, he knew his son was alive. What if? Back in Genesis 37, here comes the brothers. They've got the blood-soaked tunic and they come in and, and lay it down at him and, and he begins mourning. Joseph is dead. A wild animal has tore him to pieces. This is in the morning. And that afternoon or that evening, Joseph comes back on the scene. He escapes the, the, the slave traders. He gets away from them and he appears at his father's house and says, hey, I'm alive. And, and, and Jacob looks at him and says, no, no, you're not alive. You're dead. I've got proof that you're dead. Right here's the blood. So you've been torn to pieces by a wild animal. You're, you're dead. You're not alive. What, what would we do? What would we, th we think? He's kind of crazy. We think he kind of lost him. What if in Genesis chapter 45, when the sons return with all the evidence and all the testimony that Joseph is alive, and they return, and here they are, they're on the scene, and, and Jacob goes into his tent and comes back out and says, No, sir, here's the blood-soaked tunic. I don't care what you say. He's dead. I know he's dead. I've not heard or seen him for 22 years. If Joseph brothers had come on the scene, if Jacob had died a day before they came on the scene, do you know that he would died with full expectations of that when he would have raised his eyes up in eternity that he would have seen his son Joseph? That's how convinced he was, that he, that he was dead. Well, I believe he's been dead for 22 years and I'm not going to change my mind regardless of the evidence. What if that would have happened? So when he finds out that Joseph is alive, the only logical thing that he can do, the only logical conclusion that he can come to is that the evidence that he had was false and was wrong. That conviction that he had was wrong. He had to change. Many people today reject the truth. Many people today reject the truth and accept lies. Many of the masses of people cling to bloody coats in spite of all the evidence that we have to the contrary. You know, some folks cling to the bloody coat of that there is no creator, that there is no God. Despite the evidence, they cling to that. There's no God. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. And as you read through Genesis and the creation account, the six days of creation, and, and how God made all things, put all life on this earth, all plants, all animals, made Adam, made Eve in, in, in his likeness, in his image. All of that proof. Go to Romans chapter 1. You know, Paul could have wrote this thing today. 
for people today. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. He says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, he says, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him or as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of an incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and the birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over to the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. He says, who is blessed forever. Amen. He could have wrote that today. How true it is. The number is growing dramatically for those that believe that there is not a God, that there is not a creator, that, you know, and I look around, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden looked around. They had to look around and say, something made this, something designed this, something did this, and we can too. We can look around, we can see the same truth today that Adam and Eve did in day one if folks would just open their minds and open their hearts and realize that there is a true and living God. i tell you what, folks, the universe itself screams that there's God that there's a creator, that there's a designer, but yet somebody's going to find a fragment of a jawbone of a hog over in the dirt in China, and they're going to say that this is the missing link between prehistoric man and the homo sapiens that we know today, and then they'll, they'll, they'll be people that buy that fraud for a while, and they'll figure all that out, and they'll have all, and then somebody's going to discover, hey, you know what you found? It's the jawbone of a hog. And they're going to look back and, and they say, well, you know what? What do they do? Do they change? No, sir. No, they don't change. No, they don't take the evidence and recognize what it is. They hold on to that bloody coat. They hold on to the evidence that they thought they had and they won't let go of it. I don't care what you show me. I don't care what you tell me. I'm going to believe this. I reject that there's God. Reject there's God. I'm going to reject there's a creator. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4. Notice what the writer says. Every house is built by someone, and the builder of all things, he says, is God. Everybody from the atheists, and I read an article from him yesterday, Richard Dawkins, he is now a bona fide atheist. He waffled back and forth. But everybody from Richard Dawkins down, my friends and family, They'll believe the first part of that verse. Every house is built by someone. You see a house, you recognize it was built by someone. You see a car, you recognize it was built by someone. A watch, a computer, anything, we all recognize that it was built by someone. It didn't happen by accident. You can show somebody, you can take them out here in the woods. And you can take a big rock and you can take another rock and you can pile those rocks up about this high. And if somebody's seen that in the woods, out of, out of the ordinary, here it is, this exception sitting here, you know what they'd say? Somebody stacked those rocks. You'd say that. Stonehenge is a good example. Well, there it is. That's a, what, what in the world is that place? I don't know, but somebody did that. Somebody designed that. Then you got the totally delusional people that think the aliens came down and did it. But you know what? Even those crazy people that think that, they're confessing. You know what they're confessing? Somebody did it. Somebody designed that. And so, the universe, how complex it is, how precise it is. Friends and brethren, somebody made it. Somebody did it. And yet with all of that evidence, just in the universe alone, they're going to hang on to the bloody coat that says, there's no God. There's no creator. I'm agnostic. I'm atheist. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. There's a ton of verses about the resurrection of our Lord and proof that our Lord was resurrected. Notice verse 6. He says, He is not here, but He has risen. Remember how He spoke to you while He was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men 
and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and they returned and returned from the tomb and reported all the things to the 11, to all the rest. You know, the resurrection of our Lord. The majority of the professors in our great colleges in this land do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know why there's not prayer in schools? It didn't happen yesterday. It began to happen in the 40s, 30s, and as, as early as the 20s, 1920s in this country. When those with higher level of educations, and guess what? There's the trickle-down effect. We finally get the full impact of atheists and agnostic professors that deny not only the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but deny even Jesus himself. And that what's happened was that his disciples and those that surrounded him, they sort of embellished everything that he did, wrote it down maybe, and really what Jesus has become to many folks is just what the Greek gods were and the Roman gods and goddesses, and he's really no more than that. And that he really didn't die on the cross, that he just sort of passed out. And they got him down, they put him on a, on a rock, and after a couple nights, he came to and kind of walked around and died like everybody else. And there are some that believe other things about his resurrection, the stolen body theory, all of those things. But the fact is, we live in a society that's getting worse day by day that reveres what men say and do not revere what God says about the Son of Man in whom we only have hope in him, eternal life. They hold on to that bloody coat. And they listen to the wrong people. Well, I know what it says, but you know what? I believe other things. Because really, and a lot of that gets in the way of, he must know what he's talking about. He's a professor. Psalm 127, verse 1, unless the Lord builds the house, he says, they labor in vain who build it. What house have we built? Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Notice Paul, verse 22. He put all things in subjection under his feet. God and Jesus gave Jesus, gave him as head over all things to the church, the ecclesia, the called out, called out of the world to do the things of Christ, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Paul explained that Christ has all authority in the body of Christ. His body, the church, has been given to him. All authority is his. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. We recognize that everything that we do, we must do, word or deed. This is word or deed. We must all do by the authority of Christ, by his will. Notice Ephesians 4, 4. Let's turn the page. There's one body, Paul says. There's only one ecclesia, Paul says. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The ecclesia of Christ, the call out of Christ, is going to be built, purchased by his blood, founded in Acts chapter 2, when men were added to that body of Christ that was bought by his blood upon obedience to the gospel. You know, I'll tell you what. The world has bought into one of the greatest lies that Satan has ever came up with. And that is that we, you and I, can be united in our diversity. That it doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what you believe it is to serve God, to serve Christ. That you can be a Christian no matter what you believe and the differences that we have, listen, we can be united in them. It doesn't matter. Because as long as you're sincere, as long as you mean well, and, and I'll tell you what, people believe that. How smooth Satan has become with that. You know, he has so developed people that the very idea of sitting down and opening up your Bible and seeing what the Bible actually says about an issue and studying what the Word of God actually says about an issue. A lot of people take offense to that. The very idea that we're going to open the Bible and see what God's Word actually says, people take offense to that. And, and that falls way short of even debating. Oh my, we couldn't debate an issue. Because listen, 
as long as we're all sincere and as long as we're all striving to do the same thing, to please God, Satan's done a great job of that. And the very idea of you saying that my church is not as good as your church and the church that I'm going to is not pleasing to God, the very idea of that, questioning that, right or wrong, how dare you do that? Satan's done a good job. Matthew 15, 19, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for commandments the doctrines of men. Jesus says that anyone that teaches and worships and does things that are contrary to his doctrine, but according to the doctrine of men, vain worship, useless worship, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. And I think it's safe to say with thousands upon thousands of denominations and doctrines out there, that there are men that are teaching things that were founded by men and are absolutely without any divine scriptural authority at all. Matthew 15, 13. Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. All religious systems that have been developed by men have one thing in common. They did not originate with God. God did not start then. But yet, you have folks. We're going to hold on to that bloody coat. I've got some evidence here. And I'm going to keep this. It doesn't matter what you say. I'm going to hold on to that coat that one church is just as good as another. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. One of the scariest passages in Scripture. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Your name cast out demons. Your name performed many wonderful miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice iniquity, you who practice lawlessness. This verse is very plain. It's very plain about the teaching that we need to do the will of God. Those that do that are the ones that's going to be in heaven. And when you look at the people that are mentioned in this text, no doubt religious-minded people, seriously-minded people about serving God, they're sincere, and no doubt they're good moral people, and they're good neighbors, but you know what? They're known in this community and all around the world, people like this. You know what they're known as? Christians. They're Christians. Look at any uh, census that somebody takes. There's so many millions of Christians. The world recognizes them as Christians. The only problem is Jesus Christ does not recognize them as Christians. Not that I've seen you, I, reckon, I never knew you. Never a Christian. Never a Christian. Problem is Jesus asked for obedience to him, not sincere religion. Without a doubt, good people. But Christ says, no, no, I never knew you. Look at verse 13 and 14 of the same chapter. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few, Jesus says, who find it. A common defense made by Christianity is that we're all going the right way, the same way. We're just taking different ways to get there. You know what this passage says? There's only two ways. There's a wide way. There's a narrow way. I like what John Oxham wrote. And that's, the language is kind of different. It's wrote about 500 years ago. He said, To every man there openeth a way and ways and a way. And the high soul treads the high way. And the low soul gropes the low. And in between on the misty flats, the rest drift to and fro. But to every man there openeth a highway and a low. And every man decides which way his soul will go. How true that is. Folks, I'll tell you what, if we're going all the same place, but we're just going in different ways, where are we going? Really, truly, you think about that statement. 
we're just taking different ways. We're all, where are we going? That doesn't, that doesn't hold true. You can be driving down the road. I've got a destination in mind. Beautiful scenery. I'm enjoying the ride. Life's great. I'm going the wrong way. I'm not going to make it my destination. I have to change my way. And it's true in the same realm when it comes to eternal salvation. If you're going down that road in that way and it's the wrong way, and you realize that, you're going to have to change. Certainly. Christianity is not a come as you are party. Do you know that? It's just not. When you think about the man that's traveling the wide way, he can zigzag this way, zigzag that way. And you know everything that he's carrying. You ever come to a gate and you're carrying all kinds of stuff? Most of you haven't been men in brown, but I've done that. And you know what you've got to do? You've got to shed a lot of stuff to get through that gate. But you know what? When you're in the wide gate, you can walk through. You don't have to stop. You don't have to change a thing about the load that you're carrying. You can walk right on through it. But not so with the narrow gate. Because I'll tell you what, the narrow way and the narrow gate reminds us that we must change. We can't come as we are when we enter those paths. We must change. We must rid ourselves of the sin that we're carrying. We have to shed that. The natural man's not going to enter that gate. And I'll tell you what, you know why there's so many traveling on that wide path? Because so many are not willing to change and rid themselves of their sins through Jesus Christ. No, sir. They want to live as they are, do as they are. Everybody else is doing it. We're going to be fine. I'm just going to keep carrying it like this, and I'm going to be fine. No, sir. They're not willing to kill the old man. Colossians chapter 3. Romans chapter 6. They're not willing to do that. So that because they can do that and they shed themselves of the life that they had, they can make themselves available to enter that narrow gate. No, they just want to hold on to that bloody coat. That everything's fine. No problem. Matthew 16. You know, there are many that deny that baptism is essential for salvation of your soul. Matthew 16, verse 15 and 16, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's the summation of the gospel. Belief and baptism, that's it. People don't believe that. Because I go to turn over to John chapter 3, 16. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but they shall have everlasting life. I'm going to show you some passages on baptism. No, no, I don't want to hear that. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Acts 22 and 16, and now why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Galatians 3, 26, 27, 28. For as many have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Baptism does save you now, just like it saved Noah and his family. That water, scripture after scripture, teaches that baptism is essential for the salvation of your souls and folks outright reject it. Be just like Jacob outright rejecting that, holding on to that coat. No, sir. No, he's dead. Forget that evidence. The bloody coat of, I believe that I am saved by faith alone. What a bloody coat that is. I don't believe anything about baptism. Don't tell me that. I don't want to know that. So many people have been deluded in believing what the pastors have told them out there, that that's what they believe. You know what, baptism anyway, it's just an outward sign of an inward feeling. Turn to Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. Baptism is just that expression of, of an inward feeling. Listen, I'll tell you what the Lord does in baptism. It's essential. And he does something. It's a feeling all right. It's an expression all right. Verse 12, having been buried with him, he says in baptism, but look at verse 11. And in him, Jesus you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. How'd that happen? In the removal of the body of the flesh, how'd that happen? By the circumcision of Christ, how'd that happen? 
being buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. An operation done by a surgeon without hands. And you approach the waters of baptism with a trusting, believing faith that this act of obedience is going to remit your sins because enough evidence in this book says it will. And you approach those waters of baptism, you're not saved. If you go down in the water, you're not saved. Do you need the surgery? Do you need the surgery? When are those sins removed from the surgery? There's an operation going on in the waters of baptism. And when you enter the waters of baptism, the sins that you have are still with you. The surgeon does not remove the sins until that act of obedience because that's the operating table. That's when it happens. It's certainly an outward expression of inward feeling. Did you ever schedule something in surgery? I'm going to get my gallbladder out, cancel the surgery. Do you still have your gallbladder? You sure do. If you have not been baptized for the remission of your sins, do you know you still have your sins? You have not obeyed the gospel according to truth, according to the evidence that's been given. You have not had the surgery by the chief surgeon who removes the sins of the flesh and adds you to his body until that act of obedience. I'll tell you what, we can look at all the evidence in the New Testament. We can look at creation. We can look at the, that one church is just as good as another church. The Lord's resurrection. Tend the church of your choice. Faith only. All of those things. We can hold on to those things, whatever it is. And you might have had that one conviction for 22 years, for 52 years, for all of your life in any of these things. But when you look at the evidence and the evidence is something else, why do we hold on to that one bloody cut? Jacob believed the lie. It led him to 20, over 20 years of sorrow, grief. I'll tell you what, if you believe a lie spiritually, if you believe a lie when it comes to this book and spiritual matters, it is eternal grief. It is eternal sorrow. It is eternal damnation. Jacob rejoiced when he knew that his son was still alive in receiving that news and he shed everything else that he thought about him for 22 years. He was dead, but not now. That coat doesn't mean a thing. It was animal coat. It doesn't mean anything. My son's alive. And he believed the testimony of his sons. Every departure from God's word, God's truth, it's a lie. Every single one of them. And the temptation that Satan sets before you, it's a lie. Have you believed the lie? Have you been living the lie? Have you been holding on to that one bloody coat? If so, you need to repent this morning. You need to change. It doesn't matter how strongly you are convicted of that one thing. If the evidence proves that you're wrong, how long are you going to hold on to it? Till the horn blows? Because if you hold on to it that long, it's too late. It's too late. If it contradicts the word of God and the evidence is plain and, and you, the, what you have believed, what you have lived is wrong, I pray this morning that you repent and obey the gospel according to this book. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. Don't hold on to a bloody coat. In all things, we can change our minds. There's no law against that. I've changed my mind a lot in the last 40 years. And I'm sure you have too. As the evidence comes from the word of God in things that I need to do in my life and change in my life, I want to do that. Receive that with gladness. Don't be mad. Don't be sad. Rejoice that the Lord has given you this opportunity to obey Him. Please come. As together we stand and sing.